Welcome back. This is the first vlog, you lucky people, being filmed in the Southern Hemisphere. We've gone global. This is lovely Tapa Nui. If you don't know where Tapa Nui is, and I forgive you for that, it's in West Otago, it's close to Southland. That's on the southern end of the South Island in New Zealand. Now, I didn't know this before I came either, but it turns out if New Zealand's got a population of about five and a half, six million people, a third of those live in Auckland. Only about a million and a half of them actually live in the South Island, and it's quite a big place. We've been here for quite a few weeks now. Guess what? I wasn't organized enough to get anything out to you properly but hopefully the little bits I've been feeding you have been keeping you going. I'm sure you've had sleepless nights over it. Here, of course, is spring, so we're getting into the bulk of carvings now. I'll tell you more about that at a later stage. Otherwise, we've just been having fun, settling in, going skiing, meeting up with, I think, most of the vets who've trained in the UK, because guess what? They're here. I've been slow with it, but there's lots of stuff in the pipeline. If you're looking forward to that New Zealand stuff and you're not already subscribed, don't be afraid to click that button, ring the little bell next to it. That means you get updates about all these new videos. The very next one, I can tell you, will be the very first podcast we've done on the channel. That's with the fantastic Miranda Timmerman. She's a farm vet who's got plenty of dairy experience. She's done plenty of interesting things, despite being very early on their career and is in the middle of undertaking a Nuffield scholarship. So if that sounds interesting, click that button, make sure you don't miss that. There is one thing I was going to introduce you to uh, because I've been making very good use of it recently. It's something I have used in the UK, but here they make a lot more use out of it. Like I said, it's carving season here. Most people start carving around about the 10th of August, so that first cycle. They're aiming to get about two thirds of those done in those first three weeks. That means a lot of calves in a very short amount of time. So the upshot is that means a lot of carvings for the vets in a compact amount of time. And for a number of different reasons, it's far more common for a Kiwi vet to go to a carving where the calf is unfortunately already dead. Whereas in the UK, it's more common for us to go to a carving where the cow still has a live calf in her. Now, from a veterinary point of view, it's easy to think, okay, that's a bit sad, we'd love a live calf, but at this point, it's all about saving the cow, and there are a number of different ways to do that. And of course, there are a heap of different reasons that cow might need assistance calving, probably in part because the guys here are running bigger systems, bigger herds, more extensive, the cows just aren't looked at as frequently as perhaps they would be in the UK. Someone who's got 30 cows is gonna find it easier to look them than someone with 1500 cows. That means often by the time the vets get there, the calf is unfortunately dead and unfortunately starts to go off. So probably of the carvings I've had, about 50% have been rather smelly, they start to go rotten. Now that's not to say those cows have been left a long time, because guess what, if you left a piece of beef out at 38 degrees, which is the body temperature of a cow, that would go off very quickly. It might only take a day or even less for these calves to go really off. And if anyone's done a rotten calving or a rotten lambing, you'll know that often the calf or the lamb starts to swell, gets emphysematous, it gets sort of bubbly and crackly under the skin. And also the normal sort of birthing fluids, which would normally lubricate that birth, guess what, they dry up or are soaked up into the fetus, which means there's much less lubrication. That means it can be really difficult to deliver those calves or lambs. And because the Kiwi see far more of this type of problem than we do in the UK, they have a number of different tools to deliver those calves. Now, again, this isn't about being squeamish. At this point, it's all about the cow. We're trying to get this calf out of her because if it stays there, she's gonna go septic. She's going to die a painful death. So some of the stuff I show you, don't be shocked. It might look a bit medieval, but but this is all in the cow's welfare. And you might be asking yourself, well, cows, why not do a cesarean section, a C-section, and take this calf out surgically? That's a very good question. And in some cases, that's still the most appropriate way to go. But for the majority of these, where the calf is dead and has started to go off, they really rarely make good candidates for surgery, partly because the cow probably started to get a bit sick, which doesn't help her at subsequent recovery. But also, whenever we do a cesarean, however well we try to exteriorize that uterus out of the cow when we make our cut into the uterus and pull the calf out there's always some of that juice that uterine juice that slips back into the cow's abdomen now where the calf's live it's not ideal but it's also not a huge problem most of the time 
where the calf's rotten, and that's essentially a soup of all these different bugs, that's a big, big, big problem. It's, it's very likely gonna give the cow what's called a peritonitis, which is a really painful, wide-ranging infection of the abdomen, and very rarely do they recover from that. So that's why we very rarely do cesarean sections on those cows with these dead calves. And of course, in all of these cases, the cows had an epidural. Some of you watching this might have had an epidural yourself. That is an injection of local anesthetic into the spine, numbs the entire area, numbs the uterus, partly to make things easier for us, because you know, if someone was rummaging around in your uterus, you might have something to say about it. Safer for the vet, much more comfortable for the cow. And of course, to get all the appropriate aftercare, oxytocin to shrink that uterus back up, anti-inflammatories to kill the pain, and of course, of anti antibiotics where appropriate to reduce the impact of that infection. But anyway, that's enough wittering, that's enough caveats. You might want to see some gear. And again, some of you will have seen this. So let's get started with the simple stuff. Now, the first thing I'm going to show you is absolutely, I think, my favorite thing. You've probably heard me on this vlog before talking about what I think is probably the most important thing for any farmer or vet to have at calving or lambing time, and that's lube. You can never ever have enough lube. And one of the things I do know working with farmers in the UK is you are absolutely lovely people. But when you ask for some lube, you get like a little, a little dottle, like a little bit of toothpaste on your finger. And I must admit, I normally just grab the bottles from them, fire them in, normally get asked if I'm sponsored by some sort of lube company. But honestly, it's the best thing in the world. And the Kiwis seem to understand this. So the vets here, they don't ponce about with 500 ml bottles. Instead, they use this. This is a 20 litre drum of lube. As you can see, it's got a nice cleanable tube on it. You pump in, you pump in, and there's heaps of lube for you. It's very easy to use like at least five liters for a dry carving. So that's 10 of those 500 ml bottles. And sometimes that's not even enough. So for that reason, I love this thing. I think it's like the best thing in the world. And there's like a massive, massive drum at the practice where everyone refills these on a frequent basis. So, so that's one thing I'm definitely taking home to the UK. So, chains, we've got one, two, three. We've got two short ones and a much longer one there. That is the head chain and those are the leg chains. And again, in the UK, we most often use ropes, probably more appropriate for a dead calf. Although I do remember being told at university, chains are oddly less traumatic. Now, that's just a recollection. I might be totally wrong. But again, if you've got a dead calf, it doesn't really matter whether they're particularly traumatic or not. What people often will do is do a double hitch with the chain. So rather than just having one hitch like that, pulling on a calf's leg, they'll do a double hitch to spread, to spread the tension. Imagine that's my little th hoof there, my fingers are. That double hitch is going to spread that tension, reduce the chances of chain causing any damage if the calf was alive. Um, of course, the big upshot of chains is that they're metal and they're much easier to clean, especially appropriate if you've got a dead or rotten carving, right? The ropes are great, but of course they are very absorbent. If you have a rotten carving or a rotten lambing, they soak up all of that juice. You put them in the car, you forget about them. It comes to a hot day like this, you get into the car in the next morning, and guess what? The smell stays in your car for two weeks. These are much easier to clean. A couple of handles. I did warn you this is slightly medieval, but again, remember this is all about getting this dead calf out of this cow to save her because very often, unfortunately, the best alternative for the cow is to be put down. So keep that in mind. This is something called a cray hook or a craze hook, I'm not entirely sure. You can see there, this is it. And what happens when you pull that, that little loop there, that 
tensions this, so it's brought tighter by tension. So if you have something that's really loose or rotten and just pull the part, some of you who've done lambings will know that, where you pull the legs off and you're left without any handles. This, you can put a chain through here, that tightens, and suddenly you've got something you can apply some traction to to deliver that calf or that lamb safely. This is very similar, except it doesn't tighten up, it's just a hook. That is um, an eye hook. By far the most common cause of a calving in this part of the world seems to be a head back, and that is where the front legs are coming normally, but the head is twisted away. And that can be pretty hard to reach, like I've got reasonably long arms. But when you're inside a cow and you're trying to curve that head round, sometimes that can be really difficult. And so again, you put a chain through here, you can use that to hook into the eye socket. Sounds awful, it's a dead calf. At this point, it can't feel it. So yeah, eye hook, craze hook. This is a finger knife. So not dissimilar to the sort of like a letter opener, um, a sort of guarded knife. So these actually come with a little ring that would sort of sit over here to sort of put your finger through. The first piece of advice I got was to take that off, so I have. That makes it much less restrictive when trying to use it. And the whole idea of this, hopefully you can see, that's blunt, that's a blunt end. This is the sharp end. And sometimes, again, where these calves are big and blown up, you can imagine when something's been sitting there for a day or even slightly more, it becomes a big bacterial soup. Bacteria like to produce gas. That sort of puffs up the calf, makes it impossible to deliver. One of the ways you can improve your chances of getting it out, either taking a leg off and the use this to break the skin you can also then debulk it, which is really a nice way of saying you pull all the rotten viscera out, all the guts, the lungs, the heart. That helps the calf sort of collapse down. You can also get water belly calves. Again, some of you will know what a water belly lamb is, but it's big swollen bellies. Once you pop those, they can be delivered pretty easily. Um, so that's a finger knife. Now this is where we start to come on to really the centerpiece, and there's a few different bits of this, so I'll try and break it down for you. If any of you have dehorned cattle with wire, it's the same idea. Sometimes these calves are so big, are so swollen, are so emphysematous and blown up, there's just no way you can deliver them in one piece. Sometimes you need to break them down into several little pieces. Now this is a serious undertaking, like this isn't something any vet or any farmer would go ahead with just on a whim. This, like I say, really is a serious consideration that's made to try and save the cow, give her a good and productive life in the next lactation. This isn't something I do on a live calf. The calf has got to really be dead at this point. But the question is, how do you break this calf down into pieces when it's within the cow? And the answer really is with some difficulty. This is a pretty difficult, at least I find it difficult, uh, technical procedure. And it's called a fetotomy, it means breaking up the fetus, right? And to get there, you use something called a fetotome. Now, if you guys have ever seen cattle dehorned with cheese wire, you'll notice that sort of fine cutting wire. You have two metal handles, you saw through the horn, happy days that horn's off. It's very much the same idea here, except of course, you've got this harsh cutting wire within the soft tissues of the cow. So the question is, how can you cut that calf up with this cheese wire, this embryotomy wire, and keep the cow safe? And that comes down to this instrument called the fetotome. Sometimes it's called the embryotome, but we'll call it the fetotome here. These are these little handles. Again, if you've dehorned cattle with wire, you'll know exactly what I'm talking about. They come in two pieces. You can see, hopefully there, the wire goes in there. You tighten it up like this. Voila you've got a handle for your wire. This is your wire, so again, you're probably not gonna be able to see that, but it's a sharp cutting wire, it's a cheese wire. And at the start of carving, I was very organized. One of my colleagues suggested I pre-cut all my wire into three meter lengths. I'm beyond that point now. When you're doing that many phototomies, it's good to be prepared. It made me feel like I was on Blue Peter. But I'll pre-cut one here. So we've got this 
length of wire, how do we get it around the piece of calf that we're trying to remove? And often that's a head and the neck so we can narrow down those shoulders. Sometimes it's a leg, sometimes you're making a cut through the abdomen, sometimes you're trying to cut through the pelvis. There's lots of different cuts you can do, but whatever you're cutting, you have to introduce this wire, loop it around whatever you're trying to cut and then bring it back out. So you use something called an introducer. That looks like this. So one of my colleagues calls this the banana. This isn't the sort of banana you'd want to put in your banoffee pie, bearing in mind where it goes, but it is very good for the job. So you get your wire, you loop it through there, loop it under. I've probably done that the wrong way around. You probably want it through a little bit, but you can see what I mean. This you pass into the cow and this really extends your reach. You then go underneath from where you were and you pull that round and out. This is quite difficult to show you without a calf, but you hopefully get the drift. So that you pull that out and it curves round and then you've got your wire around your calf. The difficulty is then, we still have wire free floating in the uterus, which is not what we want. We don't want it to rub up against the wall of the uterus or the cervix or the vagina and cause that cow some real issues. So how do we get around that? That's where the fetotome comes in. And really the fetotome is this protective metal tubing that we pass the wire through. We pass that into the cow. Someone holds onto that while the cutting's taking place. That protects the cow while the calf is being cut up. So I'll show you the fetotome now. So this is it, it's, I don't know, a metre or so long, I would say. Um, it's got a, it's got a front, and it's got a, an end, the head there. So this bit would be inside the cow. We'd have our wire looping out here and then over the piece of calf we're trying to cut. This is what the vet's holding, often the farmer or who've got a student with us, they'll be doing the cutting, they'll be doing the, they'll be doing the hard work. The vet's in here keeping hold of this, making sure this stays in place, making sure the wire isn't going astray, the cow's safe. Assuming we've already got it looped over the bit we want to cut, how do you get it in? Use this device, I don't actually know the name of this, I'm gonna call it a looper. That's not its name, but you pass that down one of the tubes as so. You can see here, hopefully, that's got a little hole in it. You pass your wire in like that. Give yourself enough so it doesn't pull out while you're pulling through. And happy days. Then we take our handle, tie that to there. We do the same for this side. We've got our loop of wire here, vet holds here farmer cuts and again this really is a veterinary procedure so yeah carving unfortunately as exciting as it is for me often isn't very exciting for the people watching most of what's happening is happening inside the cow that doesn't really make it a very good spectator sport but i thought i'd show you guys this it's quite an interesting piece of kit again as a vet it's important to get your head around the squeamishness of it focus on the cow what's best for her how can we get this calf out safely and then get her back to full health i know when you start pulling out cheese wire and hooks and things you start to think what on earth am i doing but they are actually incredibly useful tools. I'm gonna to keep a tally of my carvings uh, for you guys. I forget where I am at the moment, but I'll put it up on the screen here. We'll see how many I can get done uh, before the end of the spring. We'll see how many I can get done before the end of the spring. That's it for now. I think I've just about persuaded some of the farmers that this strange Brit with his GoPro isn't a total weirdo. So I'm starting to bring them around to the idea of maybe getting some on-farm footage. Look forward to that. I've also got that fantastic podcast I mentioned with uh, Miranda Timberman. Don't miss out on that, that's coming out. That'll be out on YouTube very shortly, probably uh, later on this week. Other than that, I'll keep you posted. Thanks for watching. Again, if you haven't subscribed, go ahead, click subscribe. There's lots of good stuff coming. See you next time.